This talk is about somatosensory work potentials wave verification. It is intended for the Niklaus Children's Hospital Clinical Neurophysiology Fellows. It will be conducted using a question and answer format. The first question is Machine labeling of somatosensory evoked potentials wave should be disregarded. A true, B false. The purpose of somatosensory work potentials is to sample segments of the nervous system for the purpose of neurological localization. The sampling of the segments is carried out by using derivations that compare electrical activity from one site to another. The waves encountered in each Derivation reflect the fields created by activated structure directly or indirectly in the path of the signal towards the cerebral cortex. Hence, wave identification is paramount for somatosensory work potential interpretation and thus for neurological localization. Most somatosensory work potential machines old or new identify landmark waves but most machine base peak identification on data from this from the single tracing being analyzed and do not take into account the tracing from other derivations in the montage thus the best approach to interpret Somatosensory work potential is to trust the machine labeled peaks but verify them. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Somatosensory work potential waves verification relies on the knowledge of A. Expected waves found after stimulation of each nerve. B. Effect of differential amplifier on polarity, C, expected waves found in each derivation, D, all of the above. The foundation of wave verification is knowledge. Knowledge of the waves found after stimulation of each nerve, the effect of differential amplifier on wave polarity, the expected waves in each derivation, the neurological pathways and generators involved in the transmission of information between the point of a stimulation in the cerebral cortex, and the timing of the different waves. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, N27, is routinely used for clinical latency determination in dash somatosensory work potentials. A. Median nerve, B. Posterior tibial nerve, C. Peroneal nerve, D. Ulnar nerve. This question deals with the expected wave in each nerve. As you know, somatosensory work potentials are recorded using montages. Each montage is made of four or more derivations. Each derivation records a tracing. The tracings are characterized by waves that vary according to the technical specification of the study, electrode positions, and neurological structures involved. Somatosensory evoked potentials are usually named according to the nerve being stimulated and label based on polarity and timing. The clinically significant waves used for interpretation of median nerve somatosensory work potentials following stimulation at the wrist are, as you can see in this montage, Erb's point N13 or cervical N13 P14 and N18 
in in 20. The clinically significant wave present in the usual ulnar nerve somatosensory bulk potential with wrist stimulation are the same as those found in median nerve somatosensory bulk potentials with stimulation at the wrist. The clinically significant wave present in posterior tibial nerve somatosensory bulk potential after ankle stimulation are as you can see in this figure, the lumbar point N34 and P37. P31 is not considered an obligatory wave. Lower extremity somatosensory work potentials, in addition to being recorded after stimulation of the posterior tibia nerve at the ankle, are often studied following stimulation of the peroneal nerve at the popliteal fossa. The clinically significant peroneal nerve somatosensory work potential waves, those recorded, are identified and labeled by subtracting 10 milliseconds from the corresponding wave encounter in posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoke potentials. Thus, P37 in posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoke potentials becomes P27 in peroneal nerve somatosensory evoke potentials. So the answer to this question is C. Next question, a positive wave, Adam Apples, P13, entering a differential amplifier through E1, and a negative wave, cervical N13, entering the same differential amplifier through E2, will cancel each other. A true, B false. The second pillar of knowledge needed for wave verification is the effect of differential amplifiers on wave polarity. A differential amplifier has three arms. One is used as ground, thus it is expected to be connected to an electrode located in an electrically area not contaminated by the electrical activity being studied, but sharing common noise and two other electrodes that are there to record the electrical activity of interest. E1, which receives information from an electrode under which the activity of interest arises, this electrode is often referred to as the exploratory electrode, and the polarity of the activity arriving to the amplifier through E1 is not inverted and E2, which receive an electrode from an area that may share some but not all waveforms with the exploratory electrode or from an electrode under which there is no activity of interest. This electrode is often referred to as the reference electrode. The polarity of the activity arriving through this electrode is inverted by the amplifier. Following these premises, we can encounter six polarity different amplifier arrangements. In the first arrangement, positive activity comes into the amplifier through E1 and negative activity through E2. The positive activity entering through E1 will not be inverted. The negative activity entering the amplifier through E2 will be inverted. Thus, from the point of view of the differential amplifier, after inversion, the activity within the differential amplifier have similar polarity. And the end result of the differential amplifier manipulation will be that they will add. 
Thus, in this situation, the positive wave of a certain magnitude coming through E1 will become increased at the other side of the differential amplifier. In the second arrangement, E1 incoming signal is negative and will not be inverted. E2 incoming signal is positive and it will be inverted. Then they will be added since, from the point of view of the differential amplifier, they have an equal polarity. Thus, in this situation, the negative wave coming through E1 will become larger. In the third polarity differential amplifier arrangement, thus the E1 coming signal is positive and will not be inverted and E2 incoming activity is positive and it will be inverted. So the amplifier will see them as opposite polarity and subtract them. The end result is that the positive activity coming through E1 will be reduced. In the fourth polarity differential amplifier arrangement, the negative activity coming through E1 will not be inverted, but the negative activity coming through E2 will be inverted, so it will be subtracted from the activity arriving from E1. Thus, the magnitude of the negative activity coming in through E1 will be reduced. The fifth polarity differential amplifier arrangement consists of negative activity arriving to the amplifier through E1, which will not be inverted, and neutral activity arriving to the amplifier through E2. This activity will be inverted, but, but as the activity is neutral, the fact that it is inverted does not matter because neutral activity is considered to be zero. So we can, for mathematical simplicity, say that it is added. Thus, in this situation, the activity arriving through E1 will not be modified. The sixth differential amplifier polarity arrangement consists of a positive activity arriving through E1 and a neutral activity through E2. This activity is represented as zero, so it will produce no change in polarity and also no change in amplitude of the arriving wave through E1. Now I will go back to the first example, that is to the first differential amplifier, amplifier polarity arrangement. In this derivation, describe the one that we described in the question, a positive activity is arriving through E1 and the one electrode is connected to the atom's apple. And a negative activity is arriving to E2. E2 is connected to the next electrode. The interaction between these electrodes and the amplifier will transform the polarities as being equal. Thus, in this situation, the magnitude of the positive wave arriving through AA will be augmented. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following derivations will record ulnar nerve N20 in isolation? A. C5S to AA B. AA to EPC C. CPC to CPI D. CPI to EPC. 
The third pillar of wisdom contributing to somatosensory evoked potential wave verification is the knowledge of the expected waves in the tracing from each derivation. The median nerve and ulnar nerve somatosensory evoked potential with the stimulation at the wrist are studied using the same montage and derivations. So we will approach them together as you can see. And we will do this by looking at the derivations involved, the activity coming through E1 and through E2. And finally, looking at the resulting wave. In the C5S to Adam's apple derivation, a certain amount of negative activity is coming through E1 at about 30 milliseconds after the stimulation and the exact same amount of activity at the exact same time but of positive polarity is coming through E2. So the function of the differential amplifier will be to invert the positive activity coming through E2 thus making it negative and adding it, thus enhancing the incoming activity through E1, which was a negative 13. In the AA to EPC derivation, P3 coming into the amplifier through E1 is matched with the activity at EPC. The activity at EPC is silent because in that area there is no stimulus related activity at that point. So the resulting wave will be P13 which will remain exactly the same as it was captured by the AA electrode. In the CPC to CPI derivation, E1 will receive the activity generated by different structures corresponding to the P13-14, N18 and N20 waves. But since E2 will receive the same activity for P314 and N18 and they will be inverted, this activity will cancel each other, thus leaving only N20 present. And therefore N20 will be the only resulting wave of this derivation. In the CPI to EPC derivation, the resulting wave will be P13, 14, and N18. The reason is the same as we used to explain the resulting wave in the derivation made by Adam Apple to the air point on the contralateral side to the stimulus. The C5S to EPC derivation will result in an isolated N13. The EPI to EPC derivation will result in the air point potential. So the answer to this question is C. Next question, which of the following derivation is more 
likely to record posterior tibial nerve P37 in isolation. A. FPZ to C5S, B. CPI to C5S, C. CPZ to FPC, D. CPC to C5S. When recording posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoked potentials, the CPI to C5S derivation will result in P31, N34, and P37. The CPC C5S derivation will result in P31 and N34. The FPC to C5S derivation will, will also result in P31 and N34. Hence, as you can see, in most cases, when the electrodes are at CPC and FPC, PC, the wave capture will be the same. And I think that you can also see from the pattern that we have just described that C5S is silent when dealing with lower extremity somatosensory evoked potentials. It is important that we remember that this is so for future derivations. The next derivation is CPI to CPC. This, in this derivation, we'll be able to isolate P37. The CPC FPC derivation will also allow us to isolate P37 because P31 N34 coming through E2 will cancel the P31 and N34 coming through E1. The next derivation is CPC to C5S derivation. In this case, we will be able to capture wave P31, N34, and P37. The T12S to IC derivation will allow us to capture the lumbar potential or N22. And finally, PFD to PFP derivation will allow us to capture the popliteal fossa potential. This will be so because PF will arrive to the distal electrode at a certain time and to the proximal electrode a few milliseconds later and therefore there will be a wave because of that interaction and the wave as you know is called the popliteal fossa potential so the answer to this question is C. Next question. Which of the following derivation is not used in regular peroneal nerve somatosensory work potential? A. FPC C5S B. CPI C5S C. CPC FPC D. PFT to PFP In addition to posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoked potentials, peroneal nerve somatosensory evoked potential with the stimulation of the posterior fossa is often carried out in the evaluation of lower extremity somatosensory evoked potentials. This frame is showing the posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoked potential derivations that we have presented just a few seconds ago. The peroneal nerve somatosensory evoked potentials are 
exactly the same with two differences as you can see in this frame. The first difference is that all the potentials will occur 10 milliseconds before. The second difference is that Popliteal fossa is not recorded. So the answer to this question is D. The EP wave is generated by the distal brachial plexus. A true, B false. The fourth pillar of wisdom in which somatosensory wave verification process is based is the knowledge of the pathways of the electrical activity and the order of the activation of the different generator that produces the waves. The pathway travels by electricity following median nerve resistance stimulation and the pathway travel by Electricity following all nerve stimulation at the wrist are the same. But since by far median nerve sensory evoked potentials are done more frequently than ulnar, we will use them, that is, we will use the median nerve somatosensory evoked potentials for our explanation. Median nerve stimulation at the wrist creates an action potential. This action potential propagates from the point of the cathode in both directions, but we will only consider the rostral propagation for the purpose of this explanation. As the rostral propagating activity travels in the median nerve going from the relatively confined cylinder of the arm to the expanding volume of the shoulder, a potential is generated. This far field potential is usually not recorded using the regular median nerve somatosensory evoked potential montage, but it is recorded if we use neck electrodes. As the potential continues its rostral trajectory, it reaches the distal brachial plexus. Then, the mid and proximal region of the brachial plexus, and it is at this point that a near field traveling potential is generated. This wave is usually the first one to be recorded using a regular median nerve somatosensory evoked potential montage and it is considered an obligatory wave, implying that it should be present in all normal patients. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The waves generated by the cunietus nucleus following median nerve risk stimulation will be recorded shortly after dash milliseconds A9, B12, C18, D20. After traveling through the brachial plexus, trunk and ventral ramus, the electrical activity enters the spinal canal in the spinal nerve through the intervertebral foramen. This activity, as it travels through the trunk and the ventral rami and the spinal nerve, is called the proximal plexus volley. The proximal plexus volley produces another field, N10, that is usually not detected using regular montage. After entering the spinal canal, another potential is generated, label P11. This potential has the same characteristics as N10. 
shortly after entering the spinal canal, perhaps after the generation of P11, the activated fibers split into an anterior tear and a posterior tear. The anterior tear carrying antidromic electrical activity triggered by the activation of the motor fibers at the wrist has little or no further impact in clinical significant somatosensory evoked potential waves. The posterior tear, on the other hand, traveling through the dorsal roots and rootless is indispensable for the generation of other potentials. These posteriorly advancing fibers at this junction carrying fibers with three possible destinations enter the cuneatus tract and continue its rostral progression. As this activity traveling in this track creates the dorsal column volley, which can be recorded with a special place electrode, but more importantly, some of the fibers in the cuneatus tract leave the cuneatus tract and make contact with dorsal horn cells. These dorsal horn cells are probably those involved in the production of upper ectimity reflexes. But the bulk of the activity carried by the cuneatus tract continues as the dorsal column volley and enters the skull through the foramic magnum. At this junction, another fat field is generated. This field is called N12, and it shares the same characteristics as N10 and P11. This field is usually not recorded using conventional montages. Shortly after N12, a field called cervical N13P13 appears. This is the second obligatory field and it is recorded using regular montages. Most authors consider that cervical N13P13 results from dorsal horn cell activation without contribution from any other structures. To these authors, cervical N13P13 represents a dead end detour from the path of the signal towards the cortex. In addition, its occurrence 30 milliseconds after the stimulus and one second after the dorsal column volley goes through the foramen magnum results from the synaptic transmission that leads to a delay. Usually this delay is called the synaptic delay. In other words, since in addition to departing from the cuneatus tract, this activity prior to exciting the dorsal horn cell must go through this synaptic cleft, which takes some time, and this time is referred to as synaptic transmission delay. All the authors feel that cervical N13, P13, is a complex wave that receives a significant contribution from a field created as the activity travels through the cuneatus tract, enters the skull through the foramic magnum. Yet, a third group of authors think that there's also a contribution to N13P13 from the cuneatus nucleus. I tend to side based on convenience for interpretation with the authors that consider cervical N13P13 the product solidly of the activation of the cervical dorsal horn cells. The cuneatus nucleus to which we have just referred to as a possible contributor to cervical N13P13 
is, according to most authors, the generator of P13-P14. I find it interesting that in Levin and Luther's book, P13-P14 wave, as such, is hardly mentioned, and in it, it's instead this book presents a thorough explanation of P14 complex. This explanation reveals the many uncertainty about the generators of this wave. During the rest of this talk, I will endorse the concept of the Cuneatus nucleus being the sole generator of P13 P14. So, following the illustrated manual explanation, P13 14 is used for measuring because unlike cervical N13 P13, which originates from the dorsal horns of the cervical spine at multiple levels, the origin of P13 14 is on the rostral path of the electrical activity and in addition seems to scribe to a very narrow region in the lower medulla. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following generators could be considered of the path of conscious proprioception fibers? A. Distal brachial plexus B. Proximal plexus volley C. Cuneatus nucleus D. Dorsal horn cells This figure represents a hemispinal cord. The single dorsal horn cell on this drawing represents many dorsal horn cells. These cells are activated by an offshoot fibers or by many offshoot fibers from the dorsal column. But the activation of the dorsal horn cells do not occur simultaneously with the passage of the propagating volley at the level of the spine hosting the intended dorsal horn cells. The delay will include the time from the offshoot leaving the dorsal column so from here to here, the time it takes for the activity to reach the presynaptic region, and the time it takes after the neurotransmitter release to activate the dorsal horn neurons. So by the time the dorsal horn neurons become activated and the electrical field from this neurons generated, the dorsal column volley is already rather far from the level of the neurons being activated. The activation of the dorsal horn neurons will produce a field which will be negative in the dorsal region and positive in the ventral region, which will create an activity with negativity towards the spinous process and positivity towards the body or the vertebral. The negativity will be easily captured by surface electrode at the level of the fifth spinal process, but it can be captured from anywhere between the sixth and the second cervical vertebra. and it will also create a positivity anteriorly at the same level, as you can appreciate in this frame. So the answer to this question is D. New question. The prevailing theory is that P13-P14 is generated by A. Distal brachial plexus B. Proximal plexus volley, C. Cuneatus nucleus, D. Dorsal horn cells. As we have already mentioned, P13-P14 is 
the third obligatory wave in median nerve somatosensory evoked potentials stimulated at the wrist. After the activation of the cuneatus track, the propagating volley crosses to the other side in the internal arcuate fibers and then continues rostally in the opposite medial lemniscus, thus reaching the thalamus and activating several nuclei in it. From the thalamus, the electrical activity reaches the origin of the somatosensory radiations. It is interesting, although confusing, that in Levin and Luders, a few paragraphs are devoted, as we previously mentioned, to the discussion of the origin of P14 and the possibility that P14 originates from the distal or proximal medial lemniscus and even from the origin of the somatosensory radiation is raised. Having said this, it is good to remember that the most widely accepted origin of P13-P14 is the cuneatus nucleus. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. The prevailing theory is that N18 originates in the A. thalamus, B. tectum, C. cuneatus nucleus, D. cerebral cortex. To begin answering this question, I'd like to go back to the medial lemniscus on the site opposite to the stimulation and from there to go on with the rest of the story. Some authors believe that the same way as it occurs with the cuneatus tract, that offshoots from it go off the path to activate the dorsal horn cells occurs with the medial lemniscus. This author believe that the medial lemniscus, as it passes by the side of the tectal nucleus or nuclei, makes connection with them. These connections are in the form of offshoots that go off the path to activate the tectal nuclei cells. This activation is especially prominent at the level of the superior colliculi. Some authors believe that it is here that is at the level of the tectum that N18 is generated. Yet other consider that N18 is generated by the by thalamic activation. A view that will be endorsed for the rest of this talk. So we will consider N18 to be generated by the thalamus and not by the tectum, but it's good to know that some people believe that it is uh, that it is the result of tectum activation. So N18 is the fourth obligatory median somatosensory work potential wave after wrist stimulation. In Chiapa's book, it is stated that any wave appearing from 16 to 19 milliseconds is likely to be of thalamic origin. And they label the thalamic generator potential not as N18, but as N19. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. All somatosensory radiations end in the same Broadman area. A true, B false. Going back to the chart, we can see that exiting the thalamus, the somatosensory fibers travel towards the cortex. They do so to reach first 
the broadband area 3B. The activation of this area generates N20. N20 is the fifth obligatory wave in median nerve somatosensory work potentials. From Broadman area 3B, the electrical activity goes for further processing to area 1, where P27 is generated. Also from the thalamus, some somatosensory fibers travel in the radiation and end up in area 4. Area 4 is in the frontal lobe. And it is there that P22 will be generated. From area 4, fibers will connect to the supplementary motor area 1 and there N13 will be generated. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following posterior tibial nerve waves is not an obligatory wave? A, P31, B, LP, C, N34, D, P37. In the next frame, I will show a chart similar to the one you have just been seeing but instead of tracing the propagation of the activity triggered by a stimulation of the median nerve at the wrist, this time the chart will be for the posterior tibial nerve stimulated at the ankle. Posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoked potentials with ankle stimulation has some significant fundamental differences with median nerve somatosensory evoked potentials. To begin with, the popliteal fossa is surveyed, something that would be equivalent to surveying the median nerve at the level of the elbow, which is regularly not done. The lumbar plexus, contrary to the brachial plexus, is not surveyed, probably because of the deeper position of this plexus in comparison with the brachial plexus. The proximal plexus volley, as it travels through the caudal equina and dorsal horn cells of the lumbar eminence, activation generates the first obligatory wave, which is labeled lumbar point or N22. This wave seems to be a complex wave generated by a combination of a traveling field generated by the caudal equina and a stationary field generated by the dorsal horn cells of the lumbosacral eminence. The posterior tibialis nerve P31 corresponds to the median nerve P13-14. The generator of P13 is likely to be the nucleus gracilis, but some activation of internal arcuate fibers may contribute to it. The discussion regarding the origin of N18 when talking about median nerve somatosensory evoked potentials can be carbon copy to explain the posterior tibial nerve N34. This can be done after changing a few of the wave label to accommodate for the longer trajectory of the posterior tibial nerve. Suffice to say that at the end, we have to conclude that N34 is generated by the thalamus. N34 is the second obligatory posterior tibial nerve wave. The third obligatory wave is generated by the cerebral cortex. It is usually labeled P37, although some authors have used the term P38. All the labels followed by the letter K indicates that those are the lab labels used by Kimura in his book. At the bottom, 
are the labels used by other authors. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The median nerve N20 in an adult normal height can occur before 18 milliseconds. A true, B false. The last pillar of wave verification is knowing the timing of the obligatory waves. But it is important to stress that timing alone cannot be used for wave verification. The figure in this frame depicts the trajectory of the somatosensory fibers ending at the cortex, carrying conscious proprioception and epicritic sensation after median nerve or ulnar nerve stimulation at the rest. Now I have included a timeline to register the chronology of the different waves. It is important to remember that technical factors dictate the actual time a wave occurs and what represents the limits of normal. To give you an example from Hussein illustrated manual, at a rate of five stimulations per second, an N20 is abnormal if it occurs after 22.5 milliseconds, whereas at a rate of 31 stimulation per second, the upper limits of normal is 24.5 milliseconds. It is further stated that the height adjustment may be needed when we use these parameters. Having said this, in the next few seconds, I will strive to give you an idea of the time relation between waves. Using a rate of five stimulus per second. The first recordable potential is air point, which usually occurs at about nine milliseconds after the stimulus at the level of the wrist. The upper limits of normal for this wave is 12.4 milliseconds. Then comes cervical N13 which timing often coincide with another wave that is called P13-14. The thalamic potential N18 occurs around five milliseconds later. And N20, the cortical potential, two milliseconds after the thalamic potential. Normal timing for this potential is considered up to 22.5 milliseconds. Yet, at times, N20 may occur as early as 17 seconds after the stimulus. This situation only occurs if the thalamic potential precedes N20 and thus it has occurred before 17 milliseconds. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Motor fibers and unconscious proprioception fibers contribute to the timing of dash during posterior tibial nerve somatosensory work potentials. A, P31, B, N34, C, P37, D, none of the above. This frame includes the trajectory of conscious proprioception and epicritic sensation following posterior tibial nerve stimulation at the ankle and recorded at the scalp. In addition, you can see in this frame a timeline. The first recorded wave is PF at 10 milliseconds. This wave is not an obligatory wave, but it is often used for latency analysis and its presence and especially amplitude symmetry achieved by adjusting the stimulus intensity independently in both extremities is helpful for interpretation. The lumbar potential usually occurs at about 22 milliseconds after the stimulus. The lumbar potential is an obligatory wave. P31 reflecting activation of the nucleus gracilis takes place 31 milliseconds after stimulation of the ipsilateral 
ankle. P31 is not considered an obligatory wave. In 34, the thalamus potential occurs at about 34 milliseconds after the stimulus of the opposite ankle. This is so because the fiber cross at the level of the medulla in the internal arcuate fibers to the opposite side. N34 is an obligatory wave. Its absence indicates a problem in its generator or before it. P37 is generated by the mesial cortex opposite to the stimulation side. It is usually present after 37 milliseconds of the stimulus. P37 is an obligatory wave. The upper limits of normal latency for P37 is 47 milliseconds. And in addition to P37, we also have one more wave, which is P45. P45 usually occurs 45 milliseconds after stimulation. P45 is not an obligatory wave. Regarding the contribution of fibers other than conscious proprioception and epicritic sensation to posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoke potential in particular, but to somatosensory evoke potentials in general, we must mention that motor fibers and unconscious proprioception fibers do play a role in the activity generated by stimulation at the level of the ankle. Motor fibers represented in light blue in this frame are activated by the stimulus, a fact that may be reflected in the popliteal fossa potential and adequada equina, in amplitude of the potential and to a lesser extent or not at all in latency. Motor activation is unlikely to be a major factor in the production of LP wave and certainly does not make any contribution above the level of the lumbar eminence. The story with unconscious proprioception destined for the cerebellum, here represented in light cream, is about the same as far as contribution to SSEP is concerned. These fibers do not contribute to P31 since they veer towards the cerebellum and do not make contact with the nucleus gracilis, the site of generation of P31. Unconscious proprioception fibers involved with reflex activity, not shown in this figure, with interneuron in the dorsal horn of the lumbar sacral eminence and a detectum may contribute to posterior tibial somatosensory evoke potential, as well as to peroneal nerve somatosensory evoke potential. The same can be said of median and ulnar nerve somatosensory evoke potential substituting lumbar sacral eminence for cervical spine. The bottom line is that neither the motor or the unconscious proprioception fibers destined for the cerebellum influence the absolute latency of P31 or N34. Neither the influence P37 nor P45. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Peroneal nerve somatosensory work potentials with popliteal fossa stimulation in normal height adults with normal dorsal column system generates a thalamic potential 24 seconds after stimulation. A true, B false. This frame reflects the wave generated after posterior tibial nerve stimulation at the level of the ankle. Since the stimulus for the peroneal nerve somatosensory evoke potential is given at the popliteal fossa, 
and the distance for the stimulus to travel from the ankle to the popliteal fossa is 10 milliseconds. All peroneal nerve fiber waveforms will occur 10 milliseconds earlier than with posterior tibial nerve stimulation at the ankle. As you can see in this frame where I have placed the number corresponding to the peroneal somatosensory evoked potentials. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. What is the purpose of this derivation? A. Confirm cortical potentials. B. Confirm subcortical potential. C. Detect cortical potential. D. None of the above. You cannot tell by looking at this panel if the nerve being studied is the median or the ulnar nerve. The actual name of the nerve is usually written in the legend. The nerve study in this case is the median nerve. The study consists of left median nerve somatosensory work potential. You can tell it is the left by the letter L in front of the first EP as indicated by the arrow. In this panel, you can also recognize the brachial plexus waveform, which is typically positive, negative, positive sequence. The second derivation going from the back of the neck to the contralateral air point captures the cervical waveform. This wave is usually characterized by a single hump. The third derivation captures the subcortical waveforms. The most prominent wave is N18. Past N18, there would be no further wave in this derivation. Prior to N18, we often encounter repetitive zigzagging of negative and positive waveforms that decrease in amplitude as they go further and further from N18. The positive peak closest to N18 in this case or the point where the N18 departs from the baseline is P13-14. Remember that P13 is most often referred to as P13-14 and at times as plainly P14. This Different names are used by different authors, I think, that interchangeably. P13 and N18 are far fields. This presents us with an incongruity. If P13 and N18 are far fields, why do they do not cancel out in this derivation based on the function of the differential amplifier? I have not found a convincing explanation for this phenomenon. Also, take a look at the putative generators stated in this table. Notice, as we have alluded before, how they differ from those we have used for the most part of this talk. I guess that when it comes to evoke potential, we have to learn to live with inconsistency and incongruities. Going up in the panel, we find the fourth derivation. This captures cortical waveform, the most important being N20. The fifth derivation consists of an exploratory electrode in the anterior neck referred to the contralateral air point. This derivation captures an anterior neck waveform since the contralateral herb point is considered a silent region. The sixth derivation consists of a posterior neck exploring electrode referred to an Adam's apple electrode. It captures both poles of the same dipole created 
by the dorsal horn of the cervical spine. As you recall, these neurons are stimulated by offshoots from the cuneatus tract. So, the wave in question is negative at the posterior neck electrode, as you can see, and its timing and polarity are similar to the peak of cervical N13. Thus, the purpose of this transverse neck derivation is to confirm the cervical potential, that is C13. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, wave identification is based on timing alone. A true, B false. This montage was obtained following a left median nerve stimulation. Each horizontal division is 3 milliseconds. Thus, were we to label peaks solely based on timing, this peak would be labeled N18, since it has occurred 17 milliseconds after the stimulus and it is negative. Whereas this wave would not be labeled N18 since it has occurred two seconds before N18 and we already have another wave that is negative that occurred one second closer. Yet this is the fourth derivation consisting of CPC to CPI electrodes which will only capture potentials arising from the scalp. Therefore, this derivation should not capture N18. mostly because the electrodes are very close together and therefore any potential that is subcortical will not be recorded because of the proximity of the electrodes. As you can see in this table, CPC to CPI derivation will capture through the exploratory electrode here label E1 Three peaks, P13, 14, N18, and N20. Whereas through the designated reference electrode, here labeled E2, only two peaks will be captured, P13-14 and N18. And since they will be inverted by the differential amplifier and afterwards will cancel their counterparts from E1, the result will be that the only activity that will be shown by this derivation is N20. So only N20 will be present whenever we use close place electrodes going from CPC to CPI. As you can see, this peak despite occurring at closer to 18 seconds than any other is N20, as indicated by the machine. and as I have enlarged in this frame. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The first positive wave encountered in a peroneal nerve somatosensory evoked potential in the CPZ to FPZ channel is always B21, A true, B false. This table has been presented before. It deals with derivations. Wave captured by each electrode in each derivation and the resulting wave 
after peroneal nerve stimulation at the popliteal fossa. This is a montage of a peroneal nerve somatosensory evoked potential. The first derivation does not show any significant wave. The potential normally encountered in this derivation is the lumbar point, which is usually generated by the caudal equina and the lower spinal cord as we have previously mentioned. In this case, this wave is not present. The second derivation captures different peaks. It captures P21, which most believe originates from the nucleus gracilis. And some authors call it P31 to keep the same labeling system that they use for labeling posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoke potentials. In addition, in this derivation, we can also capture N24. N24 corresponds to N34 in the posterior tibialis nerve somatosensory evoked potential, and it is generated, most authors believe, by the thalamus. Not labeled in this derivation is P27, but I guess that you can see that it comes as a drop after N24. P27 corresponds to P37 in the posterior tibial nerve somatosensory evoked potential labeling. P27 is generated by the arrival of the activity at the somatosensory cortex. In the top channel, we find two peaks labeled P27 and N35. At this junction, I like to concentrate on P27. In this frame, I have extended an arrow from the stimulus to the designated P27, and as you can see, it has occurred 44 milliseconds after the stimulus. The upper limit of normal of P27 is actually 37. Thus, this peroneal somatosensory evoked potential by virtue of the excessive latency to P27 should be abnormal, or at least it should be causal. But looking at CPC to FPC derivation, we notice some troubling findings. This derivation hosts one clinically significant wave and no positive wave prior to P27. So we have to question if the shaded activity in yellow is an artifact or if it is real or if it is any other type of wave. Looking just below, we can see that P21 has similar characteristics. And as you recall, P21 has a subcortical origin and it is being captured in a subcortical derivation. So we have to ask ourselves if the wave in question that is the one that was that is shaded in the upper derivation corresponds to P27. And it seems that this is true because whereas P 27 is present in the bipolar derivation and in subcortical derivations, N21 can only be present in subcortical derivation which are referred to, in this case, 
a silent area, which is C5S. Thus, the correct labeling of this montage is as few in this frame. Take a few seconds to analyze it. The latency to P27 then would be 32 milliseconds, thus it is normal. Since as you recall, the upper limit of normal of P27 is 37 milliseconds. The reason I show you this example is to emphasize the need for verification of the potential selected by the somatosensory work potential machines. So the answer to this question is B. Next question, when initiating a stimulation at low intensity, cortical responses will be higher amplitude than the peripheral nerve responses, A true, B false. Wave identification when personally performing a somatosensory work potential can be helped by noticing the effect of central amplification, which I will explain in the following frames. This frame and the following frames corresponds to a right median nerve somatosensory evoke potential. It was done using a stimulus of 6 milliamps. Notice that the EP and the EPN amplitude here highlighted in green is 0. 55 microvolts and that N20 to P22 amplitude highlighted in yellow is 77 microvolts. The term central amplification is used for this phenomenon. That is, when a stimulus produces a lower amplitude signal at the peripheral derivation than at the cortical derivation. This phenomenon is short-lived. As we increase the stimulus intensity, as you can see, using a stimulus of 8 milliamps, the cortical response is already less than the peripheral response. So it is at 10 milliamps and at 12 milliamps and also at 14 milliamps. So the answer to this question is A. Next question, which of the following waves amplitude is most likely to stabilize first as the amplitude of the stimulus is increased. A, E, P, B, N13, C, N18, D, N20. This chart contains different curves representing the relation between amplitude of the different waves present after median nerve stimulation at different stimulus intensity. It demonstrates a general principle common to all somatosensory evoked potentials. The peripheral recording amplitude in case of median nerve stimulation corresponds to the brachial plexus and as you can see in this case is labeled EP for air point as you know. Notice that its amplitude starts relatively low but it continues to rise as the stimulus intensity is raised and will stabilize when supramaximal intensity is reached, which is not the aim of a stimulation during somatosensory evoke potential. In somatosensory evoke potential, the intensity of the stimulus is not supramaximal. N13, here pointed by the ar arrow, which is a cervical potential, is initially very small.
and it follows, as you can see, a totally different trajectory than the amplitude recording of the air point. You can see that at 10 milliamps, it has an amplitude of 1.76 microvolts. At 12 milliamps, has an amplitude of 1.75 microvolts. And at 14 microamp, has an amplitude of 1.74 microvolts. This is often a clue for wave identification while testing is being conducted. Because if while performing a median nerve somatosensory work potential, you think a wave is N13, but it continues to increase with increasing stimulation amplitude, the wave is likely not to be N13. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Central amplification occurs regardless of the stimulus intensity. A true, B false. This is the same chart I just showed you a few seconds before. I'd like you at this time to focus on the box area, which I have enlarged in this new frame. Notice that the EP line in cream color and the N20 line in blue color cross when the stimulus is between 6 and 8 milliamps. And also notice that central amplification is only present at low milliamp stimulation, a point I am highlighting by the magenta color triangle that you can see in this frame. So if while performing a median nerve somatosensory evoke potential, you think a wave is N20, but you go back to the lowest stimulus and the supposed N20 is smaller than the potential from the earth point, the suspected N20 is likely not to be a true N20 or the smallest stimulus that was used is not small enough. So the answer to this question is B. Thank you very much for your attention.